Today we're talking about classification with Aduco Life Sciences trainer Richard Young. Hello everybody, welcome to this session. Richard, could you give us a bit of an overview of um, classification regulations and requirements um, under the new MDR uh, for devices? Yeah, certainly. Uh, classification or product classification in Europe is never, it's not a new thing. It's something we've had in medical devices uh, since the original medical device directive came out in the early 90s. Uh, and, you know, the basic tenant of it is that some products are inherently more risky than others. And we should spend more time designing and manufacturing those well than we did on, on lower risk classification products. So risk classification is a series of rules that allow us to assign a risk to a product based on those factors and, and give us some guidance to how we're going to develop the product and how the conformity assessment is going to be conducted for it. Yeah. So Richard, could you could you um, just expand further then? What are the different um, classes for devices? Just, just provide a brief overview of each one. Yeah, no problems at all. It's, we've got a quite a weird numbering system here in Europe. Uh, our lowest classification product is class one medical device. Uh, and that's a classification you could apply to things like tongue depressors or some surgical in reusable surgical instruments. So that's at sort of the bottom end of what we do. Uh, and at the top end, we have class three products. And uh, class three products are the really invasive implantable products like uh, hip or knee implants or defibril implantable defibrillators and things like that. Things which, if they do go wrong, have a really big impact on the patient. In between, we have a split class, which is our class twos, and they're split into class 2A, which is the lower, and class 2B, which is the upper classification. Uh, and just to add a little bit of complication as well, we have uh, in our class one, we have some subdivisions. We have class one measuring and class one sterile, which we need to uh, keep in, in mind as we go forwards. Um, okay, Richard, so could you provide um, a few examples of class one devices and and maybe for each of those examples, what does it mean um, for that particular device in terms of the conformity assessment and what people need to do from a regulatory point of view? Yeah, certainly. Class one products can be split into two areas and we have some class one products which can be self-certified by the manufacturer. And we have some that require a notified body's help on them. Uh, and there, there are three types of that. We have class one sterile, uh, class one measuring and class one reusable. Uh, so those three ones need a notified body to come along and check that the sterilization has been, uh, been done correctly, uh, that the measuring function measures as you say it does or you've got a validation in place to allow you to re-sterilize and reuse the product repeatedly. That's particularly important for instruments. Um, but class one products, as we've already said, are the, the lower risk devices. They are things like you know, common disposable, uh, non-invasive products that, that aren't gonna go into the body. Uh, and, and they're things like uh, tongue depressors would be a good example of a, of a class one device. Uh, we have some of the uh, instrument receptacles, uh, things like oxygen tubes that we used to deliver oxygen to patients can be non-sterile uh, class one medical devices. It all depends really on our assessment of the contact with the patient so those devices which aren't invasive uh, which have really low contact with the patient and they're really low risk are the ones that tend to be class one devices so richard could you provide some examples of class two a's and sort of what does that mean from a regulatory point of view yeah so when we get on to class two a products uh, these are slightly higher risk classification than other devices they tend to be a bit more invasive than uh, than the class one products we've already discussed. 
uh, and may be used for a very short period of time. So some good examples of class 2A uh, products, things like um, syringes with needles uh, used to take blood and things like phlebotomy sets. Those are all class class 2A devices and things like intermittent urinary catheters. So they have a very, very short period of exposure to the patient, uh, often sterile disposable devices in class 2A uh, and, and have that sort of lower level thing with them. Uh, as we'll see when we look at the classification rules, one of the interesting bits that gets into class 2A a lot are uh, Electri uh, software devices you know, which are very really new to the industry uh, and a lot of those which are down to monitoring healthcare and critical functions fall into this classification as well so quite a broad classification covers an, a huge range of products as all of them tend to do um, from a classification point of view the class 2a and the consequence of that is you need a notified body involved in the certification of products. So rather than concentrating, as we discussed, class one products, or maybe the aspects of sterilization for a class one sterile product, once we're into class 2A products, the notified body is interested in all the elements of the design and manufacturing of the product. So they'll be looking at choices of materials, shelf life, packaging, all of those elements will start to come in uh, as, they, as they're relevant to the general safety and performance requirements. So we've gone up a level, we've got a notified body involved now, and we've got that expense and that interface that we need to maintain for the product from the lifetime of the product. So Richard, can you provide an example of um, class 2B devices and sort of, yeah, the regula regulatory implications for them? Yeah, by all means. Class 2B's two, two are almost a sub, they're a sort of a way station between Class 2A's and Class 3, for want of a better term. Um, strange nomenclature at the end of the day. And within Class 2B, we, we tend to find products that are more, have a longer period of exposure. So if you have, for example, a, a bandage, which might be a class 2A or a class 1 sterile product. It could be a class 2B product if it's intended, and intent is very important here, what we claim for a product, if it's intended to be used to help wounds, like ulcerated wounds, uh, uh, heal, uh, or if they're exposed to the patient for a long period of time. So the urinary catheter example I used as a class 2A could also be a class 2B product if we intend that product to be used over a period, over a period in excess of 30 days. So how we use the product and what we're saying its intended use is can influence the these factors as well, as can the assessment as risk as we go forward, as we'll see later. So, Richard, could you tell us a little bit more about Class 3's examples of them and, and, and again, what are the regulatory implications for, for Class 3's? Right, Class 3's are our top end from a risk perspective and as our application of the regulation is proportional, as we go up in risk classification, we expect the amount of effort that is already said to, it in, in, uh, to, to it go up here. So we expect to have to have more clinical evidence, more follow-up, more controls around the class three product uh, as we uh, as we take it to market and go through the conformity assessment process. So at the top end from a risk perspective, uh, some really good examples of common examples of class three products are things like orthopedic implants, as we've already mentioned. So you know, knee and hip replacements would be great examples that we see commonly in use. We probably know people who've got those. But a class three products can be things that go and come in contact with a central nervous system as well. So um, instruments and materials specifically designed for neurosurgery. Those are class three products as well, because as we can appreciate things that are going to be touching your brain are probably fairly high risk. 
uh, and things that actually come in contact with the central circulatory system, so the heart and the the major vessels, those are uh, class three products as well. So that's things like um, stenting catheters, angiography things, things that are going to go in and, and do that. Um, the, ca the cannulas that are used during open heart surgery because they're contacting those materials. All of those are class three products. There are a myriad of products uh, that uh, class that classification relates to, you know, the range of medical devices is utterly vast. And so the classification rules try to describe everything from the tongue depressor example that I gave earlier, all the way through to incredibly complicated devices like MRI scanners. So the classification rules need to encompass this variety uh, and, and give us a set, a basis for determining what this risk classification is rather than listing them all out. So it's really important that once you, you have an idea about the product and its intended use, you understand the classification rules and how they can be applied to your product going forward.